we up? Yeah, we are. Um, hello again. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, tonight we welcome, I have my cheat sheet here, um, Dean Javi, D Dave Evans, who collectively have over 75 years of product innovation experience, uh, applying design thinking to everything from... Microphone. Doug, use mic. Oh, from using everything. <laughs> yeah. I haven't been doing this very long. <laughs> um, uh, they've done everything from uh, developing the Apple Mouse to robots to healthcare to life design, and we're going to learn a little bit more about that. Um, Dean was David Kelly's first partner in the original company that became IDEO, and is currently working on health and wellness projects in Watsonville. Uh, Dave, in addition to writing uh, a bestseller and teaching life design at Stanford, Dave was early Apple, co-founder of Electronic Arts, and lives here in Santa Cruz. So uh, please welcome Dean and Dave. So we're going to start with, uh, we're gonna, I guess we should need to level set. What is design thinking? And if the clicker is working, we'll be able to, okay. it is. Okay. We're on the first slide. Okay, I can't teach sitting down. You know, I'm, I'm Dave, that's Dean, by the way. Okay. The, um, and we're both old, so, and we're both old white guys, and that's so almost undifferentiated. Um, <laughs> okay, so, here we go. Nope. That's it? Where the, uh, are the slides in? They're not there. You go to show them? You've gone too far, go backwards. Oh, there we go. Well, so all the drama has been lost. Okay. okay. So, what is design thinking? Sure. So, who's heard of design thinking? Who's been trained in design thinking? Don't worry. Okay. What am I wasting your time for? The um, um no. Who knows um what the original design thinking is? The recent renaming of the process, which was originally called human centered design, right? So HCD. So, which started back how many years ago? <laughs> We're doing trivia night. Uh, about 60, about 60 years ago, and one thing we and it did start at Stanford uh, way back in when. Uh, David Kelly, many of you have heard of, who was the ranking both um, tenured profit designer at Stanford and the founder of IDEO, Dean's former uh, partner, my former client. The um, was the third generation guru of design at Stanford, actually standing on the shoulders of Bob McKim and before that guy, John Arnold from MIT, who came to Stanford because MIT wouldn't let him do it. Um, and actually, does, and this is not often talked about, but a lot of design thinking's earliest ideas were developed with Michael Murphy and the human potential people, with naked people in hot tubs at Esalen. Um, <laughs> not that far from here. That doesn't come up in the brochure a lot, but it's true. Um, and so, one of the easiest ways to understand design thinking is to understand what it's not. Um, so there's lots of ways to think. David Kelly says ways of thinking or tools you put in your tool belt. You want more than one tool. Design thinking is one of them, and let's differentiate that. So there, are, there's engineering thinking, where you you solve your way forward. We have a tame problem where you know what all the information is. You can fix it. You can get it right the first time, even maybe the second time, but it'll stick. The answer works every time. That's engineering thinking. And by the way, I think the default thinking in the world at large, certainly here on the West Coast, is engineering thinking and misapplied. It can get us in trouble. Um, then there's business thinking where you're never right, you're never done, but you can get better. If you go to a quant school, you can get better with numbers, um, you know, <clears throat> and actually understand how to, you know, love your customer more or make more profit or whatever it might be. Um, and that's a perfectly valid way to think. There's research thinking where you analyze your way forward using a methodology going all the way back you know, to Aristotle and Plato and thinking of how is it that we actually create new ideas in a rigorous manner. But there's a whole class of problems for which none of those work particularly well. We call wicked problems which is where you don't know what you're looking for until you find it. You can't reapply it anywhere else because it's totally dynamic and totally localized. And those are really human problems. And for that, you have to build your way forward because most of the time you're inventing a thing you've never seen before called the future, by the way. Uh, and by the way, am I talking too fast for you? No. 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 Good. I'm not going to slow down anyway. Just wanted to know. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> that's the way it works. Uh, and. Um, so in design thinking, you know, we build your way forward through a prototype iteration. We describe it two ways, using mindsets on a process. Um, you've maybe seen some of the stuff before. So the mindsets, well, how do designers think? Um, there are a whole bunch of them, but the five we tend to lean into most often are, first, curiosity. That's where the energy all is. Then radical collaboration, which doesn't mean collaborating with radicals per se. It means radically inclusive collaboration, asking everybody, all the experts, all the points of view, if you really listen in deeply to what's going on, then you're going to probably need to do a reframing. You're going to change what you think and think about it in another way. 
Um, be mindful of your process. Know when you're flaring to have ideas, when you're focusing to make decisions. You know, where is it that we are in the process? And then finally, when in doubt, bias to action. You don't think your way out of the problem, you do stuff to get out of the problem. Um, then the steps are first uh, to, we first empathize. Your problem find before your problem solve. You've got to listen deeply into what's going on. You're probably asking the wrong question already. Don't worry about it. Go see what's really going on. Then you define the question that's worthy of solving or the problem that's worthy of being approached, what your point of view is about that. Then have a whole bunch of ideas in order to then start prototyping. And then from those prototypes, you test them, iterate like crazy, and then you finally empirically build your way out to an answer. Um, it all starts with step zero, which is accept, by the way. You can't solve a problem you're not willing to have. Most people's problem is not really their problem, it's their problem with their problem. You know, and if you got a problem with your problem, that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> and so you gotta start in reality, you gotta start the way things actually are, and we can build forward from there. Okay, so that's a semester course in about four minutes, and now back to you, Doug. Hey, wow. Woo! I'm gonna slow it down. Um, so uh, let's go. Yeah, we're here. Um, next time we'll put a monitor up here so we can see where we are. But I think uh, the next, now that we have a foundation, the next question is, um, tell us about like some of your personal best experiences with design thinking. Yeah? Dean Hovey. Uh, you know, when we got started, we, we didn't have this road map of no, no, no. how it all worked. So I'm just going to tell you how it first got started. Uh, we were fortunate to start our consulting business with a project that was my master's thesis called a differential cell counter. And we set up shop in uh, downtown Palo Alto. And fortunately, we had our third customer was Apple Computer. And so uh, we started working on the Apple II accessories. Um, we did the Apple III. We started working on Lisa. And that's actually yeah. when I first started working with Dave. Yeah. Um, but what I remember most was one sunny afternoon in the summer, I had a meeting with Steve. And uh, I had an idea about what I wanted to do. And I was about to tell him about it. And he said, stop. i got to tell you about this thing, a mouse. And I looked at a mouse. Well, it turns out that he was up at Xerox Park because Xerox wanted to uh, invest in Apple. And Steve said, OK, but I get a tour of Xerox Park. So on Wednesday and Thursday, he was touring around. And he saw the star system which was one of the first graphical user interfaces of a computer system. And he was just blown away, excited, et cetera. And so on Friday is when I met with him, and he said, we got to do this. And he explained what it was, and I'm sorry, going, a mouse. What's a mouse, you know? Uh, and then I said, OK, I'm in. And I remember walking out into the parking lot, getting in my car, and I said, well, where do I go buy mice parts? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, this is where the build comes in before all this other stuff. Yeah. So I went to Walgreens and looked for parts that I could use to build something that looked like a mouse, which turned out was a butter dish and some plates. And then I went to the deodorant department and I bought all of the roll-on balls that came in the roll-on because I needed a ball. And so I went, I went back home. Went to my garage, and over the weekend, I was the mad scientist putting together epoxy and all this other stuff. And through that process, I was actually working through a lot of different things. Uh, one was, could we actually do this or not? And I, I felt convinced that we could. But I should back up now and say, well, where does this design thinking come and all this other stuff? So S Steve was very clear about what he wanted. He gave me four items. I'll call them constraints. And you're thinking, well, normally you want to think out of the box. Well, he was very clear about four things. He says, Dean, the, the current product costs about $300 to build. To get it to, to regular consumers, we have to build it for less than $15. Secondly, it seems to clog up and break about every two weeks, and you have to disassemble it, clean it all out, put it back together. <clears throat> Thirdly, it needs to work on a tabletop like Formica, which right. in front of you. And this was the historic part. Then he leaned back and he said, and work on my jeans. <laughs> so those were the design constraints that I had. And they were actually quite freeing, because to get to $15, we needed to figure out how to do things with injection molded, automatic assembly, 
and it needs to work for two two years. And you know what? It turns out these formica tops are actually dirty in the real world. And this little mouse going around is like a vacuum pulling up stuff. So it got really dirty quickly. So we had to figure all that stuff out. But as I was thinking about it and, re and now thinking about empathy, I thought about when Steve leaned back and said on my Levi's or my jeans. I said, what is that about? And what it was really about was how Steve believed he wanted to co connect with computers in this sort of casual, intimate relationship of moving away from the desk onto this. And so he, he had that first vision of how in the real world can I reach into the virtual world and bring it to life. And so the mouse was really this way for a human to interact with the virtual in a, in a really intimate way. And as I thought about that, I also said, you know, that really means that it needs to be a really seamless experience. I can't be thinking about these things. It just has to be natural, right? So as soon as you're thinking about it, you're going to miss it. And so that, that was the key design element, but it also led to a great experience. And you can probably trace how that went from the mouse to the iPod to the, to the iPad, and then the full experience that we're now experiencing with our phones. That connection of the real world into the virtual world in the most natural way possible. So that was where empathy and design thinking and all these other things came about. That was the first step in the process. Now, the other part that we needed to do was we were this product design firm of about seven people at a time. And we were trying to differentiate ourselves from being just uh, industrial design. I don't know if you know the difference, but there is a difference. But our team was a very diverse team that we all collaborated on this project. We had a software guy, a hardware guy, an electrical hardware guy, a uh, fine arts um, kinetic sculptor, uh, <coughs> myself, an injection molding expert. And so the, all of us collaborated around this product, which would then create a demonstration of what product design really was. It was a holistic, full-scale design down to the human factors. And so that was a defining piece for us as a company. And once we had done that, when people would say, well, what have you done? We'd point to the mouse. And they go, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and away we went. So that was also part of design thinking is how do you make a business grow by choosing the right product and using a diverse amount of people working on something together. That's great. Thank you. Um, did you want to add to uh a personal best experience. Well, uh, we we'll go way back. So we'll do a really antique story. So um, in the early, early, early days of electronic arts, I mean, um, um, we're, we're going to make software worthy of the minds that use it. And it's going to do this whole different kind of a thing. And so we were trying to come up with a bunch of stuff. And it wasn't just going to be a game company at the time. It was going to be a whole range of creativity stuff and home learning stuff and home productivity stuff. And a lot of that died off, but nonetheless. Um, and so then we had, um, so we decided we'd try some sports stuff. So it was before EA Sports, you know, and the whole massive multi-billion dollar industry of sports simulation in the gaming world now. Um, and so we uh, started working on a basketball game, and, and, and we contracted with a couple of teenagers to work on this thing. Um, and then Trip Hawkins, who's the founder of the company, there are six of us who were invited to be the co-founders, and again, Trip Hawkins, who's my boss at Apple and worked close with Steve. Um, um, was the founder and had a real vision for this thing. He started his first game company out of his locker in sixth grade at the age of 12. Um, so he, was, he, was, he would have won the, the prize in, in sixth grade. Um, and so we started working on this basketball game and, um, and then Tripp gets the idea that, you know, well, if we're going to do design, they're going to really design this thing. Because almost all the sports simulations were totally driven by statisticians and nerds and, you know, what we now call moneyball people. You know, had no real athletes involved at all. He said, we got to get the athletes involved. So we hired Doc, uh, Julius Irving and Larry Bird, so Dr. J and Larry Bird, um, to be our designers. They had not done product design before um, and had not been contacted by product companies to do this before. But we brought, and trust me, the day that Dr. J walked into the office, everything stopped. You know? um, and so we had this prototype. Uh, it actually was a five person game. We ended up with a one on one game later on. And, and, and the kid who wrote this thing is playing it. And Dr. J is watching the thing be played. And the, the you know, little dots are flying around. It was horrible stuff. You know? and, and at one point, he kind of goes, That would never happen. 
And the kid goes, what? He goes, that would never happen. He goes, what do you mean? He goes, well, well, that's that guy, that's that guy. He just blew that pass twice. Um, if he had not passed that off, he would never, you, he would never get the ball again. So that guy's going to be isolated. He's going he's to wait out for three plays. So you gave him the ball, he would never get that ball. That's not the way the game is played. You know, you guys all think the plays are running off, so there's all tons of politics happening on the floor all the time. You know, and that would never happen. We go, oh. So they start designing the way the basketball game is actually played, and we get into this conversation with these guys who realize we want to do a more human product that the user can actually relate to. They don't play five-on-five -five NBA basketball. They play one-on-one -on -one basketball in the backyard. And so we said, well, Dr. Jane, Larry, do you ever play one-on-one? -on -one? We go, well, yeah, we play one-on-one -on -one all the time when we can. It doesn't happen that often. We love the game. We kind of go, well, can we do that? They go, that's the game you want to play. So that's how Dr. J and Larry Bird go one-on-one, -on -one, which started the whole thing, occurred. Now, here's the backstory. The backstory is that we started working on that, and it was, it was clearly going to be a hit. And then we're having an exec staff meeting. They started at 4 in the afternoon and went to 9 o'clock every Monday night. Um, and we're sitting around the table, and we, that comes up. We discuss, well, hey, you know, how's, how's Dr. J and Larry Bird going? It's going really well. It's going to look like it's going to be a hit. We're getting, the second release is coming out soon. Hey, that's great. And then Tripp's sitting at the head of the table. You know, he says, well... So that was a really good project. We all go, yeah, that was a really good project. And, and he goes, so we should do that again. We go, okay, we'll do it again. You know? And he goes, no, actually, here's what we should do. We should just invent the entire sports simulation industry. Because when you think about it, those are serious users. They're repeat users. There's new data every year. You can make constantly new products. It could be a massive opportunity. And if we get in front of this thing, we'll just kick ass and fucking own it. So I think we should just invent the industry and fucking own it. How about that? We're going to go, okay. We'll do that. And he goes, okay. And we did. You know, and so we just sat there and decided to invent it and fucking own it. And, the, um, um, and then here's the real part. And then he would go, okay, great. And then like three seconds go by and then Trip explodes. He just completely loses. He goes, God, he just completely goes into this tirade. And then he comes, and, 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 and I'm sitting right next to him, and I go, what's the problem? And he goes, why do I have to all the, have all the best ideas? I have all the best ideas. I want you guys to have better ideas. Why don't you have better ideas? You know, everybody's like this, right? And I said, I assume that was a rhetorical question. I said, do you want the answer? We all know the answer, Chip. Do you want to know the answer? And he goes, yeah, what's the answer? And I go, because you've been thinking about this since you were 12. You have better ideas. So back to the design thinking thing. Even though we say it's a methodology anybody can learn how to do, it actually does help to be incredibly innovative and inspirational and care deeply about something, because he cared deeply about this stuff, you know, and he was able to come up with amazing ideas that invented multi-billion dollar industries. And Steve cared really deeply. We don't put that on the slide, but actually being good at what you do, love it to death, so that you can actually can not just be user empathetic, but user fanatically compassionate, um, will allow you to do better work. So, you know, it's been fun. It's been a fun ride. That's great. Thank you. Wow, so we've heard some great stories here that are, uh, don't really fit the theme of, of this discussion, which is the dark side. <laughs> right. Uh, the dark side. <laughs> of design thinking. Tell us, what is the, the, the why, how are you inviting everybody and what is the dark side here? Well, I'll, I'll tell you about the dark side on the, on the mouse. You know, when Steve told me about this, I thought, well, maybe 50,000 people will want to use this thing or some other number. But, you know, it turned out that probably close to a billion people on the planet that have used the mouse. And we never fast forwarded far enough to think about that, to think about what if somebody's using it eight hours a day? Carpal tunnel, raise your hand. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Keyboards too. Yeah, well, okay. But, I was also in but there, there's a sample of, if you haven't thought through the future consequences, you wouldn't, wouldn't see that. And you know, we were just really focused on, well, does it fit the hand well? Does that work well? Choosing the button so when you push it, it doesn't move around, so you get the click and all that kind of stuff. But not thinking about hundreds and thousands of hours of people doing the same thing over and over again. So there's one piece, which is forecasting success and then asking yourself, what happens if it really is successful? 
Yeah, but when we, when we thought up user-friendly computing, we were not thinking about user-addictive screen habits. Um, you know, it turns out user-friendly and steroids is just user-addictive. Um, and we didn't see that coming. So the, the dark side is the unintended consequences. Um, you know, I worked in the early days of the first Ethernet email systems. I was a VP of marketing for the original patent holder for voicemail. I, I, I ran call center technology for IBM. If you've been put on hold in the last 20 years, it was probably my stuff. That'd be, um, um, you know, you're welcome for being invited to talk to a disk drive instead of a person. The, um, and all that's non-simultaneous communication. I remember literally we, had, we were running the first beta, one of the very first Ethernets. Bob Metcalf comes over to the office at Apple and installs the first Ethernet. And people start doing email, this email thing. Like, wow, what concept. Um, and the, and the, in no time at all, you know, alter egos start arriving. You know, the Walter Mitty's start writing flame mails that will melt plastic, you know. You know and like people have a completely different personality online than they do in person. And that's causing some trouble. Um, and so all these other dark sides of the unintended consequences, particularly long-term unintended consequences um, that, you know, can, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time, and the dark side can be pretty significant. So we have to take a different kind of responsibility, particularly now that we have internet inter enabling, where you know zero to a billion users can happen in three days. You know the unintended consequences take off in a hurry. Let me just make another point, which is um, we're at a point now where technology is moving so fast that humans can't evolve that fast. So the notion of creating a tribe or a culture that's now global, that then gets focused down into these bubbles, has caused a lot of the problems that we're experiencing today. You know, Zuckerberg never thought about this when he was doing Facebook. He was just trying to categorize people at, at college, right? But now, they're literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to figure out how do we look at the two billion posts a day and figure out what's good, what's bad, what's fake, what's horrible, and they're scrambling. But see, that, that's the thing is that it's moving faster. AI is coming along and all these other things. And so as designers, we now have to move way forward to anticipate those things because they're going to affect us in ways yeah. that we can never, never dream of. The dark side is figuring out how to scale to the multitudes that that are going to adopt these new technologies. It sounds like new products. Well, I mean, it, it sounds simplistic, and it is simplistic, but the um, it just means you got to really quadruple down on the empathy step. I mean, the empathy step isn't just do one quick lap around the room to the current user in the current market segment that will pay for their first round of investment, and you're good to go. Then sell it to Google and get out, and you're done. Um, you know, because nobody has time for an IPO, no, we'll, just, we'll just sell it to Google, um, only for the purpose of killing it, you know. What you really want to build is something Google would rather nobody else has, then they buy you and throw you away, and you get to keep the money. Um, that's a very common exit strategy right now. The, um, and so, Mark, that it, is that Looker's strategy? <laughs> that, that empathy, no yeah, strong opinion to follow, but the, the, uh, that empathy circle is way too small. You know, so it's got to go broader out, it's got to go broader in distance, and it's got to go broader in time, which means, you know, it's not that hard to do, but you've you really got to do the imaginal work, because you can't talk to the two billion users you haven't met yet six years out when the thing actually worked, um, if that's the way it's going to go. Um, so I think it's the empathy step, and then that says, I mean, does that then loop back into the way you do it the first time? Okay, so we're going to jump now to um, a sort of an open question uh, and we've, we've got some ideas of, of things, topics to talk about here, but um, we've got like 10 minutes, and I want to make sure that we get some questions okay. from the audience. So I saw Dave raise his hand here. Is there such a thing as global design thinking, and who's thinking in that direction? Is there such a thing as global design thinking? Is there such a thing as, I mean, yeah, the, one of my colleagues at Stanford, guy named Banny Banerjee, you have an idea, you know Banny? Yeah. Um, um, so there's design, there's uh, design for big changes, design for big systems design. So there are a lot of people who theorize that stuff and how do you redesign, you know, whole sectors of socioeconomic capacity and that kind of thing. That's not my particular field. It makes for some great papers. Um, 
I'm, I'm not entirely clear on how much traction it's getting, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but I will say design thinking has moved off into I mean, education, economic development, um, and when countries are developing it. Um, so it ha the, the, the basic idea, this bottom-up, it's not that complex. Like, actually talk to the people who are going to use the stuff, you know, understand that before you set the question, um, and iterate a whole lot of prototypes to get some empiricism back, not just theoretical stuff. So that can be applied pretty broadly. I think, though, that um, a systems thinking approach is, is now even more important today than it ever has been, because it's really ecosystems that are, are starting to come to play. Apple's a great ecosystem, right? There's, so there's um, places where you accumulate stuff, like Facebook is actually aggregating stories and pictures of all their people that create content, right? Google is a platform that allows people to um, <coughs> search and find things. And so what you need to think about is we're now moving into a fully connected, integrated system. And therefore, you need to start to think about systems in general. And in fact, that's something that I'm starting to think about as I look at Watsonville and how, does, how do you help uh, communities collaborate in a meaningful way to achieve the vitality that they have the potential for. I, I, w I hope you can talk more about that. I mean, you're doing a pilot project in Watsonville right now. You're working with Jacob, I believe, and, and others. Is there more you can tell us how you, how, how, do we, how do you use design thinking to grow uh, a thriving community? Well, there, I think there's really a couple of pieces. One is, when you think about empathy, you think about the actual people in the community. That's one. And then you have the various not-for-profits, the city and county governments, and you have businesses that are all in that community. And so you need to understand what is important for them. And then you need to ha have conversations around, well, what's really important for you as a community to move forward? And, and the community will tell you. Part of the problem, though, is that they're, they're all in little silos, and, and, and they don't come together and say, here's the problem that we need to solve first. And if we do that, then here's the next one, and here's the next one. So if I, even if I was to step back and look at Santa Cruz, and uh, one of my favorite questions is to ask, so what sucks? Right? So if you had to say, well, what sucks in Santa Cruz? I'll throw out one. I understand that somewhere between 20,000 people a day commute over the hill, plus or minus 2,000. That's a lot of time in a car. That's a lot of carbon. And why is that? Well, because they can't have the jobs here, right? And then there's people commuting up from Watsonville to do service jobs here. And there's people in Salinas that are going to Watsonville. And so we're all moving around trying to get to where we need to be when we should try to figure out how do we build our communities so that we can all do well together. And then there's the housing problem. It sounds like the five blind men and the elephant, right? I mean, everybody's going to have a little bit different uh, position on it. Emma. Um, yeah, is there an argument for slowing down tech, and what could that or would that look like if we were to slow down tech? I'm not sure it's relevant if there is an Is there an argument to slow down tech is, is the question. There, yeah. there, um, it doesn't matter. It won't. <laughs> it, won't. <laughs> it won't. No, I mean, no. I mean um, who do you call? <laughs> hey, Mark, or, uh, could you get Sergey on the phone? Let's all just take a break. What do you say? You know, I mean, it's not going to, I mean... This is the thing about, about design thinking. Design thinking has a brutal commitment to reality. One thing that happens when you get people together to design stuff is you start where you are, let's go get, find some way to go do something, not agree on or come up with a counter argument. Um, I ran a, so Embed, I mean, Embed is a great example of people trying to collaborate together in a designful way uh, to work on rising, you know, the, the entire community. Um, and I put, a hundred people came in my breakout two years ago, um, and I, we tested, are people more interested in doing their own thing, or are they more interested in getting together with other people and maybe making some progress on something? Um, and so I got a hundred people, and, and I said, okay, you can only work in, in groups of like, you know, 10 or 12, um, are, and are you willing, or nine of you willing to give up the thing you care about to work on bread? Bread? Bread, yeah. Bread, because I'd rather work together on something than work alone unsuccessfully on my own thing. 
and everybody was willing to compromise to make some traction and to work together. So the thing you could do collaboratively, like what Dean and, Dean's, Dean, and what Dean's doing in Muscleville, what Sibley's doing, you know, here and around the world, those are real get stuff done things that involve clever collaboration and design. And that's that, there's a lot of opportunity there. But it's real different to do stuff than talk about doing stuff. What about the county planning department? Yeah. <laughs> yes, next question. <laughs> Every county should have one. Actually, uh, Carlos is here somewhere. The, is that right? County administrator. Uh, is Carlos? <laughs> yes, I'm here. County planning department at your service. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, he's been outed, and there's a long distance between him and the door. You can get to him before you leave. <laughs> No, he, That's he, door. He is, uh, he's been great at introducing us to the people that are part of this underneath network that makes stuff happen. And so we've got various silos that all just need to start talking to each other and forming this plan. And, and I'm very excited. I mean, you know, what Digital Nest is doing right, is, it's great. Is, is a perfect example of that. There's so many of these things happening in Watsonville that if they were coordinated in a way that makes sense, it's just going to, it's going to be fabulous. So th what we're doing is, is hearing all of those voices, and helping to put the plan together that's already in people's heads, and prioritizing and bringing resources to it. Okay, let's take two more. Ron. Hi, so um, I work for a company that started in Santa Cruz that's now about 500 people and its focus start, started as a company to address the mouse injury problem, so thank you. Um, so We're creating employment for you, thank you very much. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So my focus is, is normally on community projects. Just to get a little nerdy for a second, you said in the beginning, one of you, I think maybe you, Dave, that human-centered design has changed into design thinking. Now, I always love the term human-centered design, because it's really clear what it means, whereas yeah. design thinking is a very unhuman term. I don't know what it means until you describe it. Yeah. Why would you say that's the, the term has changed? Oh, it's a, it's a pure branding move on ideas part. I mean, so you could argue one of the most important contributions David Kelly made to the field was renaming it design thinking. The reason being, when he talked about um, human-centered design or, or, or this design capacity, people kept thinking that um, I need to be a creative person, oh, I can't do it, and there's all this natural resistance because we're thinking about graphic design or ergonomic design or artistic design or 3D modeling or what have you. And so he said, look, it's, just, it's really just a different way of thinking. You know, we're, you know, we're not smarter than you, we're not more clever than you, we're just better at getting unstuck than you. Um, and, and so uh, he happened onto that, and the term design thinking dropped a whole bunch of barriers and resistance. Um, and I, I think you know, losing the humanness in the, in the nomenclature was a bit of a loss, but the whole idea was, you know, I mean, IDEO has expanded massively and their brand kills everybody else, so I think they're pretty happy with the outcome. We'll take uh, one more. Yeah. The two of you have known each other for a long time, just out of interest. What is a project or a product or an issue that the two of you have always thrown around ideas for designing to fix or create, but have not yet done? <laughs> just want to make a really fun rebel? Do you still want to make a really fun robot? You've been wanting to do that forever. <laughs> I, well, I, I actually did a great project uh, right after I guess I left IDEO. Yeah. Uh, little little robot that um, my view was that uh, I've moved beyond train sets and that robots, and this was when Star Wars was just coming out. And so uh, we created this really cute robot that you can program with a Mac. Uh, and that would also respond to a TV show through the vertical retrace. And uh, I went and talked to Spielberg and uh, got Jim Henson to be on my board. And then the market crashed and we didn't do it. And I was way too early to. I mean, battery technology wasn't uh, far enough along for this little guy to do well. But maybe, maybe he'll come out of the closet. He's, he's up in my attic still. <laughs> but actually, 10 years after we put him in a box, I went in and flipped the switch, and he goes, it's Monday, go away. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> in our own image, I guess. Margaret. Got a mic? Does it work? Hello, I'm here. Is it on? Just yeah. shout or, or shout. Shout, I can shout. Yeah. I can shout. Um, so my name is Margaret. Um, I work at a company called Looker. Um, and and you're president of Santa Cruz Works. And I'm the president Woo! of Santa Cruz Works. Um, and I've been along, along the ride with Doug um, through the years. 
So one of the things, I, I totally want to call you on this, and I apologize in advance. Um, <laughs> but I think a lot today about diversity. And you talked about diversity in the, in the group that you started. Like, you were talking about how the group was diverse. And it, and it sounded like the, the group was diverse in their, your, your skill set. Skill set, yeah. Um, and so I'm just curious about like the oh here we got we have volume yeah. now <laughs> hi um, so I'm curious just like where you see the movement because like, there's there's clearly some movements around diversity it's, it's certainly the the buzzword of the day yeah. if you're working in a tech company we talk about DEI all the time we think about hiring diverse workforces creating inclusive workplaces all of those things and so I would posit that I think a more diverse future is going to be a more potentially ethical one, that we might think about these things. So I think that there's value in that, but I'm just curious like, where you, where you see that playing in, do you see that possibility that that can be part of how we can kind of leapfrog ahead to yeah, create a better future? There, so the question of, yeah, sorry. You know, we're not all that diverse, and, the, um, and <laughs> it's, it's a, oh, yeah. certainly in Stanford, I mean, DIB, diversity, inclusion, belonging are huge issues. And um, no, the absolute truth, so in fact, one of the best synoptic characterizations of design thinking is the now 25 year old Nightline show uh, called The Deep Dive, which was when you know David Kelly had lots of hair, um, and they do the shopping cart, the shopping cart, the famous shopping cart project, which is a half hour show with, um, what's the Nightline guy, I can't remember his name, uh, Doug Koppel, um, interviewing them, and it's a fabulous video. It really is the best synoptic, you know, half hour semester course on design thinking I've ever seen, and it's all white guys and a white girl. Um, and so we've, we've almost stopped using it entirely. We, we started with, um, and by the way, this was a long, long time ago when these issues weren't being attended to. By the way, here's a picture of what a bullpen audio looks like now, and it's a lot more colorful. Um, and so, you know, we got it, you know, but still there's some content here. So there has been a huge issue. I mean, Silicon Valley is built mostly by white men. Um, and, and so we, and we are old white men, I and mean, that's really simple. The, um, <laughs> I mean, Doug's just white hair, he's not that old. The, um, um, but um, we gotta change that, and empathy isn't sympathy. So really clever white designers caring deeply about Latinas isn't the issue. It's hearing from the voice in person. That's empathy. I actually get it because I am it. That's where empathy comes from. It doesn't come from sympathy, it comes from empathy. So if you're gonna do design well, you simply have to become diverse. Full stop. We've been faking it for way too long. Ooh, I like that. I'm gonna quote it, thank you. All right, unfortunately, we're out of time. Are you guys gonna stick around a little bit so people can talk to you after? No, I will be. Okay, great. All right, thank you so much. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.